Um, excited to be with you uh, this morning to be able to um, preach and bring the word of the Lord before you. I, I hope truly in my heart of hearts that that is what it is. But I'm letting you know from the beginning that this is going to be tough. This is going to be a challenging sermon this morning, but it's going to be challenging in the way of not just difficult for me to preach and for me to prepare and everything like that, but it's going to be challenging in the way of that it's likely to rival, to contradict many of your thoughts, many of your beliefs, many of uh, your feelings on the issue as we approach this subject of the call to give. So this morning, we're talking about giving, and we're talking specifically about giving financially. Now, I know some of you, you might have just immediately shut off. Might have immediately just from this point, you know, gotten mad, said, all right, from this point on, you know, I'm not going to agree. You know, if you're like Todd Richardson, then that's probably you, that you just Shut your, shut your ears off and just decided I'm not gonna agree with whatever, with whatever he says. Um, but I ask that you not be like that. I ask that in this time that you take this moment to make the decision to say, I'm going to be open to the Lord today because that is truly my heart, what I'm asking of you is not that you be open to my words and my reasoning and what I'm saying and my opinions, but that you be open to where the Spirit of God leads you and leads your family. So be open in your heart is what I'm asking of you and open in your heart to the Lord. Now, just as there might be some people that just shut off in this way, there also might be some new people in here, maybe new to Crossroads, new to church in general, um, maybe this is your first time, whatever, and you're saying, oh boy, here we go, one of those churches, one of these churches that they just always talk about giving, they always want me to give something, they always want me to give to their cause, they're just like everybody else in this uh, season, that they just want me to give towards their cause, and that I will be uh, you know, better in their eyes if I do that. You might say like, man, this must be one of those churches, they talk about this all the time, they treat you better or treat you worse depending on how much you give, whatever like that. Look, I, I just, you don't have any reason necessarily to trust me, but I'm asking that you trust me when I tell you that I can promise you that that's not us. That's not us that are going to, you know, elevate you to a position based on how much you give or that we're not gonna talk to you or treat you worse based on how little you give. Like, that's not us, that's not Pastor Brandon. We're taking one Sunday out of 52 to focus intensely on the subject of giving. And I'm asking that as we gather here, you trust me that we're not going to continue to just hammer you on this. But we are gonna take this because I believe it's what the Lord has for us and our staff believes that this is what the Lord has for us. Now I wanna continue that trust and I wanna just be upfront with you. And part of the reason on our staff having this conversation of uh, me coming and uh, preaching this morning and specifically preaching on this subject of giving, then the reason that is, part of the reason is we are behind, we are lacking. We're gonna have a church conference after service today. There's no secret that we are behind financially. I wanna be upfront with you about that, okay? That is part of the reason that we're having this conversation is because of that. But I can honestly say, and I fully believe this in my heart, at the end of the day, we don't want your money. At the end of the day, we want our church's hearts to be surrendered to Jesus and surrendered to everything that he would ask of us. And so in talking about giving, it's because we are desiring that our church members and our church attenders be people that are sold out, surrendered followers of Jesus 
and that includes in the area of giving as well. I can honestly say that we would rather have a hundred impoverished people that are sold out to Jesus than a thousand Pharisees giving and giving and giving multitudes that, heart, that their hearts are riddled with evil. We would rather have people that are sold out to Jesus than your money, but I do believe people that are sold out and surrendered to Jesus are also going to be sold out and surrendered to Jesus in the area of giving as well. We'll talk about that more later. But I do think this is an important topic, subject to preach on, to teach on, to discuss in life groups. As I was putting these notes in the computer, um, I was overhearing Pastor Brandon's life group and I was so encouraged to hear that the conversations of giving were being brought up and um, I do think it's important for us to do that in the church setting. But probably even more so, I believe that's important that it's brought up in conversation in the household as well, right? Teaching kids about giving, about the call to give. I can say growing up that this was absolutely true for me. So my dad, he's a pastor and he's passionate about this call to give. He's passionate about teaching his congregation about this call to give and he's passionate about teaching his family about this call to give as well. I remember in elementary school, maybe even earlier, we would receive an allowance. It wasn't a lot, but it was an allowance that was given to us because, you know, as kids, we actually had to pay for things uh, my, in my household, um, which is a crazy concept to think of. But as a kid, we actually had to pay for things if we went out to eat and it was, a, you know, just something that uh, we kind of pushed. It was like, no, let's go out to eat. You know, at that point, we were living in Wrightsville, Georgia, um, which only had a Dairy Queen in the subway, but we would go to Dairy Queen and love those little ice cream bars that had the chocolate around them and that sort of thing, and we had to buy that. So we were given allowance so we could buy stuff like that, that sort of thing. But part of receiving that allowance was that we also had to give part of that allowance to the local ministry of the church. That was part of my parents' teaching and giving us this, and they would also say, you also have to practice this discipline of giving to the local ministry of the church as well. Remember, I had my own little envelopes. Y'all remember those little envelopes? They had your name on it, they had the date, they had your address, so you could either send it in or you could bring it, and then if you got mixed up, you know, I remember one time that I gave the wrong date and it just messed everything up. Like, I felt like the whole church was gonna fall apart because I gave the wrong date when I brought it to church that day, but um, that was what they taught us in elementary school, maybe even earlier, that we were to give to the local ministry of the church. Fast forward to middle school. We shifted from receiving an allowance to a commission. Okay, now some of you have a commission-based job. As a seventh grader, I did too. We got paid based on the chores that we completed in our household. So this was a program um, by Dave Ramsey, and they, we had our own little board and everything. It had, uh, like, I had one and my sister had one. It had the chores that were our responsibility, all right, and it had the amount that we would receive if we did these chores, and then it had the week that you, like, it had, you know, Monday through Sunday, or it might have said not Sunday because it was like you don't want to work on Sunday. So Monday through Saturday had this where you would check off that this is when I did that chore. So then at the end of the week, you would receive, on Saturday night specifically, you would receive the amount that you had earned from the week based on the chores that you did. Now it was like a dollar each chore. There was obviously a limit because we couldn't just like go take the trash out every day and just rack up on money, all right? There was, uh, there was a limit to what we could do, but... It was teaching us, of course, how money works, how earning money works. It was a great thing. My brother, he's in eighth grade. Um, he's doing the same thing right now. They got him going. He made bank over Thanksgiving because uh, they had to keep running that dishwasher. He had to keep unloading that dishwasher, just racking it up. He got at least $4. It was, it was a big deal. Big deal. But received this Saturday night and why on Saturday night? Because 
purpose was we receive our commission, this payment, on Saturday night so we could do what? So we could give on Sunday morning. Dave Ramsey, if you've taken him, if you've been a part of his course, maybe you've heard of the envelope method, okay? Talking about that you have three envelopes for give, save, and spend. Back in this, just like we had the chart of the commission board, we had actual printed out envelopes that had on it big letters and it had the whole design, everything, give, save, spend. Purpose being to teach us about the responsibility of properly budgeting our money Right, if we made $10, then we would give a dollar to the give, give a dollar to save, and have eight to spend, all right? It would teach us that, but it's huge because on Saturday night when we would receive that, we would know that on Sunday morning, the next morning, that we were going to give to the ministry of the Lord that next morning, and that we were gonna give with a worshipful heart that next morning. We were taught that in our home. Then fast forward. College, I was in college, off at college, mind you, at the University of Georgia. Yes, we're hurting today, and that's all I'll say on it. Um, but I had this little just part-time job. It was like 12, 15 hours, something like that, on campus. Not like I was raking it in, but we had this job, and then I went home for either Thanksgiving or Christmas, and I was with my dad, and he just asked me a question because my dad asked tough questions and, and praise the Lord for a dad that asked tough questions, right? He would ask questions straight up. He's like, Micah, have you watched pornography recently? He would ask questions of, you know, are you, like, are you sure that this girl that you're talking to or dating is one that would glorify the Lord? He would ask questions, you know, when I was just getting out of a relationship of how did I plan to grow after getting out of that relationship before seeking another relationship. Praise the Lord for a dad that will ask tough questions to their children. And the question that he asked with this was, Micah, have you been faithful to continue to give while you're off at college? And he didn't care if it was given back to FPC Sandersville or if it was giving to the church that I was going to, but he was asking the tough question of had I continued to give? And the answer was no, I, I honestly hadn't thought about it. But now that I was thinking about it, I was super convicted. It's like, man, okay, I, I know that I need to give. And so I asked a um, man that I call my youth pastor, I asked him if he thought that what I should do is should I go back and add up all of what I've made already and then give off of that? Or should I just start now and just, just say like, all right, from now on, I'm just going to give and give what I'm supposed to give and know that I'm supposed to do that. And he, he answered my question with asking me another question. And he, he asked me the question, he said, well, Michael, what are you convicted to do? And I didn't like that answer because I wanted somebody to tell me like, no, it's okay, just keep that money in the bank and just, just go on, you know, and just start doing what you're supposed to do now. But I knew what I was convicted of when he said that, and it was to go back and look at the paychecks and look at the deposits and look and factor in and say, okay, I'm going to give to the Lord what I knew that I should have been giving all along, and I'm going to surrender that to him. Once I did, then, I was relieved of that conviction. And I say all this to say about teaching this in your home and this about my dad. My dad was not teaching us this to get more money for his church that he was pastoring. My dad was not teaching us so that he could boast and say, look, my kids are giving. My dad was teaching us this because he himself was a sold out, surrendered follower of Jesus. And he understood that as a sold out, surrendered follower of Jesus, then that includes your money as well. And part of being a sold out, surrendered follower of Jesus' parent is that you teach your kids what it looks like to be a sold out, surrendered follower of Jesus. And as you teach your kids what it means to be fully surrendered, part of that is teaching your kids that part of being surrendered is that money doesn't have a hold on you. Because the reality is, 
whatever you're not willing to release has its hold on you. And if you're not willing to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll give to the church then, then I believe that money has its hold on you. But the reality is, it's all God's anyways. It's all from him, it's all because of him. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we will surrender all to him. First Timothy 6.10, we'll get into our main text in a second, but a classic verse, but oftentimes a misquoted verse is First Timothy 6.10, it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The love of money. Oftentimes people say, you know, well, money's the root of all evil. This verse tells us very clearly, it's not that money is the root of all evil. If money was the root of all evil, our church should have nothing to do with it. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Why is this? Because love of money, and we'll get into, you know, what drives our lack of giving in a second, but, you know, love of money ultimately, as every sin, is rooted in pride. Pride saying that, hey, I know better, so I don't have to do this because I know better, but this has driven people away from the faith and pierced people with many griefs. If you are riddled with pride, you are riddled with evil. And this, you know, evil is something that all of us struggle with and King David did as well, which takes us to our main text. If you would, turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So one very interesting thing about this narrative here is it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, but it's also in 2 Samuel chapter 24. So if later you wanna go back and look at 2 Samuel and see how these parallel or how they differ, it's kind of interesting but you can do that in 2 Samuel, but for our purposes today, we're gonna be in the First Chronicles account of this story and this narrative on David's military census. So if you would read with me verses one through eight, chapter 21, it says this. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring a report to me so I can know their number. Joab replied, may the Lord multiply the number of his people a hundred times over. My Lord the king, aren't they all my Lord's servants? Why does, the Lord, why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Yet the king's order prevailed over Joab. So Joab left and traveled throughout Israel and then returned to Jerusalem. Joab gave the total troop registration to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 armed men, and in Judah itself, 470,000 armed men. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the count because the king's command was detestable to him. This command was also evil in God's sight, so he afflicted Israel. Verse eight, David said to God, I've sinned greatly because I've done this thing. Now please take away your servant's guilt for I've been very foolish. We'll pause right there. So starting out verse one, we see that Satan is at work here. Satan is, you know, getting David uh, to order this census of his military to count it up. We're not sure why Satan wanted David to do this. We're not even sure why exactly this was a sin. The Bible doesn't tell us why it was a sin, what part of it. People have offered up suggestions on what makes this a sin. Um, Some people have said that David was wanting to inflate his ego at his military numbers. He was wanting to boast in pride at the forces that he had. Some people say that uh, what he was doing was he was counting and making sure that he had enough to be able to handle the battles ahead, to have enough manpower and firepower to say like, oh, we'll be good going into these wars rather than trusting in the Lord and trusting that they will be okay and that the Lord will protect and provide for them. Others offer up different suggestions. We can't be sure 
exactly what the sin is that David commits here, but we can be sure that it was indeed a sin. Verse seven makes that very clear. It says, the command was also evil in God's sight, so he afflicted Israel. We see, obviously, it was a sin. We also see that David was warned that this was a sin. He was warned by Joab, verse three. All right, it, Joab's pleading with David, he tries to say, hey, the Lord's gonna take care of us. He tries to say, hey, we're gonna be okay. He tries to convince David, like, please don't do this. He says, why does the Lord, my, uh, why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? He understands that it will bring guilt on Israel. He understands in verse six that he hates this command. He says, but he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the count because the king's command was detestable to him. All right, so he knows, he knows, Joab knows that this is not right. This is sinful, all right? David realizes this as well. Verse eight, David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I've done this thing. Now please take away your servant's guilt for I've been very foolish. All right, it's clear this was a sin. And I do believe as we flip this back on us, and we look at this in our perspective and we say, well, you know, a sin in regards to giving, like what, what's the sin here? I don't know, but lack of giving, withholding giving from the Lord, I do believe is also a sin. Proverbs eleven twenty four in the ESV says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. You know the reason that they suffer want is because they're in sin, and sin cannot satisfy. So as they seek to pursue financial gain and seek to withhold their finances from the Lord, then it's not gonna be satisfying to them. They're just going to continue to want because this is a consequence of sin. And just as there's multiple possibilities for what drove David's sin, there's multiple possibilities for what drives our sin of withholding from the Lord what we should give as well. I'll offer up two possibilities for what drives our sin. First being greed. First possibility for what drives our sin, greed. Psalm 10.3 says, for the wicked one boasts about his own cravings. The one who is greedy curses and despises the Lord. Greed is despising the Lord because you want what you want and you don't want the Lord and you don't want God to have what God wants. You know, but greed is defined in the dictionary as an intense and selfish desire for something. Specifically today, we're talking about in the way of money, but this looks like that you want your money for something else other than God. That you have an intense desire, whether it is for a number in a bank account, whether it's for retirement, whether it's for future, whether it's for that you want this security, whether it's for an item, right? You're looking like, hey man, I've always wanted this boat. I've always wanted this, this Bronco, this Jeep, this truck, whatever it may be. I've always wanted this thing and I want my money to go to that. So I'm gonna withhold from God for now because I want this thing. You know, we've always wanted to take a trip. We've always wanted to take that trip to Greece or Italy or Grand Canyon, whatever it may be. You say, we're gonna withhold now because we're looking to go for this thing. That's greed. Saying that I want that more than I want what God wants for me. And greed, just letting you know, spoilers, is going to end in dissatisfaction. That proverb, you can pursue that thing, but when you get that thing, you might be happy for a little while, but it is not going to satisfy you. We can only be satisfied in the Lord. So today, as we gather here, do not be greedy with your finances, pursuing all of this stuff, but be giving and selfless to the Lord because it's, if you are greedy, it's going to end in dissatisfaction. Now the other reason that I'll offer up that I think we most often see for people failing to give is lack of faith. Lack of 
faith. This came up over and over in conversations about this sermon, lack of faith. Matthew chapter six, verses 19 through 24, it'll be on your screen. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That first verse, storing up treasures on earth. Look, that's, that's lack of faith. You're storing up. You're saying, hey, we gotta save this for a rainy day. We can't, we can't give it to the Lord. We gotta add to our bank account. We gotta add to that retirement. Storing up. It's lack of faith. You might be saying, like, it's, not, it's not lack of faith. It's lack of math. You might say, like, it's simply not there. I, after you take into account paying for the house and the car and the doctor's bills and the kids and food and gas and clothes, like it, it simply isn't there to give. You might be saying, it just wouldn't make sense to give to the church, to give to the Lord. It just wouldn't make sense. A couple responses for that. First of all, this is why we don't give after we add all those other things up. We give as what the Bible calls a first fruit, meaning that we give first. Like I said, that we would receive that commission payment on Saturday night so that we could give first thing Sunday morning. We didn't take it and say, oh, well, I have all this to pay for during this week. I gotta get this gift for uh, my friend, and so I don't have it to give this week. We don't do that. We give as a first fruit because we're giving in faith. We're saying, I'm gonna give now before I do the math so that I step out in faith and say, okay, God, I'm giving you what's yours. God, I ask that you work, God, and that you help me in this time because, God, I just know that I'm supposed to give in faith, so here you go. God, you take care of the rest. That's why we give first fruits, first of all. Second response to that, God isn't a God of math and reason. You say, Mike, it doesn't make sense for me to give. Rarely does God. Does it just mean that, oh, God's going to supernaturally provide, I'm all of a sudden just gonna get a check in the mail because boom, like I gave, so now I get. No, I don't think that that's what this scripture is telling us to do. Might you have to make some tough decisions? Absolutely, might this be an area of growth for you that the Lord, he doesn't provide you with the area to say, hey, like here's the money, but he provides you with the wisdom to say, hey, this is how you are to spend your money. Maybe that might be the case, but I do believe that when we are faithful to give, that the Lord provides. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now with this, take it and say, okay, well you just said that I'm not supposed to give to get. How does this fit? You might say, you know, those prosperity preachers that have this prosperity gospel that say like, hey, you give 10 a day, so you're gonna get 20. God's going to bless your finance, all this sorts of stuff. As, you know, these are the verses that take this. I wanna quote my dad. <clears throat> he said, could a person claim that this sounds like the prosperity preachers? Sure. These, along with other scriptures, are the very ones they dis- distort. But look at it this way. If God's blessing that he pours out on me is not one bit financial or material blessings, but instead is simply peace in my heart and his divine wisdom about how I'm to live that honors him and how to properly use the other 90%, 
that alone is far more blessing than I can ever imagine. In no way am I saying that we should give to get, because it's all about the heart. Look back, Matthew 6, 21. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, this giving is a matter of the heart. When we give to the Lord, it shows where our heart's at. This verse continues on, 22. It talks about the eye, right? The eye's like a picture, okay, into um, the rest of the body, lamp of the body, saying if your eye is healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, and you can, if, if you've ever been to the continent of Africa, you can see how this is true. You can, you can see the difference in the coloration of their eyeballs to where you say that, hey, it, there, there is something unhealthy going on with this person. They, they cannot be fully healthy on the inside. Just looking at the light. That's what this is saying here, okay? It's looking at the eye as a picture of if the rest of the body is healthy or not. But it's sandwiched in between these two verses Seems kind of odd, talking about where your treasure is, your heart will be also, and then at the end there, no one can serve two masters. It's like, where, where does that fit? Where, where do we see, like, how does that make sense? Like, I, I don't get that. I believe what this is saying and what this is giving us a picture of is that wherever your money is at, is a picture of where your heart is at. And whatever you're treasuring is a picture of where your heart is treasuring. And so if you are holding on, whether it's in greed or lack of faith to your finances and unwilling to let go of that, saying unwilling to give, then it's not telling us how you are with finances, it's telling us where your heart's at. And it's not about telling us, I'm sorry for saying that, it's about telling you and telling God where your heart's at. Because we can't serve both God and money. And I'll tell you <coughs> which one is the one to let go of and give up, and that's the finances, that's the money part. Now, it is about the heart. It is about where your heart's at. And I believe David is a good representation of a heart for the Lord. He's known as a man after God's own heart. Verse eight, we saw he was very repentant. All right, sake of time, we're going to skip a little in this chapter. You can go back and read it. I'll summarize it for us. Basically, God's word comes through a prophet to David and he gives him a choice. He gives him a choice to select three different options of punishments, consequences for this sin that he has committed. David selects the option that for three days there would be a plague on this people. This happens, a lot of people die. And then we pick up verse 17. So if you would, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 17 through 24. It says, David said to God, wasn't I the one who gave the order to count the people? I am the one who has sinned and acted very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Lord, my God, please let your hand be against me and against my father's family, but don't let the plague be against your people. Verse 18, so the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. David went up at Gad's command, spoken in the name of the Lord. Ornan was threshing wheat when he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid. David came to Ornan, and when Ornan looked and saw David, he left the threshing floor and bowed to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, give me this threshing floor plot so that I may build an altar to the Lord on it. Give it to me for a full price so the plague on the people may be stopped. Ornan said to David, take it, my Lord. The king may do whatever he wants. See, I give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the, the 
threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. King David answered on and no. I insist on paying the full price, for I will not take for the Lord what belongs to you or burnt offerings that cost me nothing. We'll stop there. What happens here? Okay, so David, he gets a word from the Lord through prophet to go up. He tells him where to go. He tells him what to do, build an altar, offer a sacrifice. Once David arrives, this man tries to give King David it for free. Just like, hey, you, like, you're the king. Like, you have it. Like, have it all. I'll, I'll provide everything. Don't you worry about it. You just, you offer this sacrifice and I'll provide everything. David's response is verse 24 saying, no, he's not gonna do that. He's going to pay full price. And why? Because he says, for I will not take for the Lord what belongs to you or offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. That cost me nothing. Look, this is coming from a heart for the Lord. David says, I'm not going to give a sacrifice that cost me nothing. Why? Because that's not a sacrifice that's him just giving somebody else's sacrifice. But David goes before the Lord with a heart for the Lord and offers the sacrifice up because he is repentant. Now, David, he does this not just because he wants to give a sacrifice just so that he can do what God wants, to appease God, to have favor with God. That's not his drive. David understands from a heart of worship and love for the Lord comes the desire to give. Now on the flip side of this, and I've yet to address these people, but the flip side of this is the people that they give, but they do so reluctantly or in pure motives. We'll call it giving impurely. This might look a variety of ways. You might give because you say, oh, I, I know it's just what I'm supposed to do, or maybe it's just what I've always done. Or I saw mom and daddy, when I was growing up, they would put a 20 in the offering plate each week, so that's what I do. You might say, man, they would, they would be upset if they found out that I wasn't giving, so I'm gonna give. Maybe you say, it's kind of like paying your dues, I'm a part of this church just like I'm a part of any other club and I'm gonna give because I'm just paying my dues because I'm a part of this so I'm going to give towards it. Maybe you give because you expect certain things, a part of the church. Maybe you expect us to have a church. You expect us to have pastors. You expect the lights to be on. You expect the bathrooms to work. You expect uh, there to be coffee out there. So you say, well, I'm gonna give towards that because uh, you know that makes sense. Like I, I gotta you know, give to be a part of that. So I'm gonna give for that reason. Maybe you take it a step further and you say, no, I give because I love the church. I love what we're doing. I love being a part of this. And, you know, I think we're doing some really good work. So I'm gonna give towards some really good work. Maybe you caught the problem with that last one and the problem with all of them. The issue is that's man-centered. That's centered on people. It's that I'm giving because this person used to do this or this person would be disappointed in me if I didn't give or I'm gonna give because I, I feel like, you know, it's what I'm supposed to do or, you know, that sort of thing or I feel like I should give because it's what we are doing and, you know, we're doing really good work. That's all man-centered. Our giving cannot be driven by man and driven by people. Our giving has to be driven by the Lord and our giving has to be and should be Worship. Your giving should be worship. We're, we're gonna have a time of offering later. Oftentimes it feels like it's a separate part. This is a time where we give our tithes and offerings. Look, this is a worship service. Our time of offering is part of worship and our giving personally should be worship as well but it has to be worship for the Lord. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. But we have to be giving cheerfully. 
It has to be out of a heart that loves the Lord, a heart that desires to worship the Lord. I cannot make you give. I cannot coerce you to give, and you cannot give out of compulsion. That is doing a disservice to yourself and the Lord. But my desire today is that you walk away from today with a heart pierced by the Lord that says, I want to give because I love God and I wanna worship him in all areas of my life, including giving. And this comes the question of, well, how much should I give? How much is appropriate? And this is the part where I talk about that a tenth and 10% is a good start. And maybe you didn't shut off earlier. or Maybe you shut off and then you came back. But this part right here just made you shut off again. Say, nope, that's, that's not right. You just read that verse. Each person should do as he does decide in his heart. I don't have to give 10%. And you're right. You do not have to give 10%. It is not tied to your salvation. It is not tied to your favor in the church. You cannot give out of compulsion. But I do believe that it's a good start to give 10%. You might say, no, that's, that was an Old Testament thing, okay? You know, Abraham did that, that's their thing. It was in the Levitical law, they did that, that's their thing. It was in Malachi, guess what? Even though it was close, it's the last book of the Old Testament, still Old Testament, so don't, don't have to do that. You're wrong, that sort of thing. I'm just offering up my opinion here. And I wanna offer up a quote, and this was one, I, I'll just be honest, it rocked my world, and so I, I desired to share it, what a pastor said regarding this 10%. It says, if 10% is what they gave under the law, then why would I give any less being under grace? Man, I am absolutely floored by that comment. I know that stepped on a lot of toes. But that excites me. Why? Because grace excites me. Because grace fires me up because I understand that when they were given 10% under the law, they were having to gather up all their crops, their animals, factor all that in, give 10% of that. And what did they give it to? They gave it to the Lord, but they gave it to be burnt up. I don't know if y'all read in D group reading, and I don't know if y'all read maybe some of the parts that the D group reading had us skip over, but I thought it was very interesting that they gave that for the Lord literally to burn it up. We get to give to, for it to be used for kingdom advancement. It's not just burn up. It's not just to nothing. We get to give for it to be used for the glory of God. But under that law, man, it's not a requirement anymore, but when I understand Jesus and understand being under his grace and understand what he has done for us and when I surrender to his grace and celebrate his grace and I say, 10%, what is that to what he has given me? <clears throat> Not just financially, but with salvation. Why would I give any less to ones that were being required to do it when I understand that I am now under the grace of Lord Jesus, that he died and was a sacrifice for my sins? Reading through Leviticus, I did read those parts that it had to skip over, and it was tough, but I spent a lot of time over Thanksgiving being thankful that I didn't have to do that stuff that Leviticus was talking about. I spent a lot of time reading that to say, man, I'm thankful that I don't have to worry about what appropriate animal is to a 
be brought before what sacrifice. I'm excited that I don't have to be worried about what meat I eat. I'm excited that I don't have to be worried about the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant or what I'm supposed to do or the Ark of the Tabernacle and how we're supposed to put that together. I'm excited that I don't have to worry about priests. I'm excited that we don't have to worry about what I do if this is wrong with my body and that what I'm supposed to put on it and how long I'm supposed to stay away from people and all this sort of stuff. I'm real excited that I don't have to worry about that. But I'm most excited that we now have Jesus that stood in our place, died for our sins, paid for our debt, was our sacrifice. So now as I go to live, I can say, yeah, I can live however I wanna live. I don't have to give out of you know, compulsion, but I can give because I freely love the Lord. And as I look at this and celebrate this and so excited that with Jesus and what he has done, I don't think that it's something that is to be used by us to say, oh, well, now that I don't have to do all that other stuff, now I also don't have to give to the Lord. I don't think that that's what God would say. I don't think that's what he would say at all. And I don't think, honestly, that God would say that we should just be given a token amount that really doesn't impact us and hurt us at all. I think that we should give sacrificially. Do you know why I think that? Because we talk about the New Testament. We talk about Jesus. You know what Jesus wants? He wants all of us. You know how we know that? Because all through the Bible, you know what God wants? He wants all of us. Jesus just continued to make that clear. Remember um, the lady with the two coins. Let's read about that. I'm excited. Mark chapter 12, verse 41, it says, Sit, this is Jesus talk, or talking about Jesus. It's sitting across from the temple treasury. He watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then the poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Am I telling you that you have to give all that you have to live on? No, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying is necessarily a case for all of us in here as well. But what I do believe it's telling us is that he wants all of us. He wants every part of us. And guess what that includes? Your money as well. He wants you to be surrendered to all parts of yourself and that includes finances, okay? <clears throat> he wants all of you. And I don't know what the stronghold might be for you. Maybe it's greed, maybe it's lack of faith, maybe it's something else, I don't know. But my encouragement to you and challenge to you today is to do as David did and repent. Repent, go before the Lord. He built an offer, he built an altar and offered a sacrifice. We have an altar here today to where you don't have to provide a sacrifice. Jesus has always, already provided that sacrifice. But you can offer yourself up, all of you, to say this is not going to have a hold on me because Jesus has his hold on me. And I hope today that you realize that as God has given you everything, how could you go on with a relationship with him where you give that which costs you nothing when he has given everything? We're gonna go into a time of invitation now. Stephen's gonna come up. We're gonna pray. However the Lord might be working on you, you might be really mad and you, won't, you might wanna come hit me in the face and you can come try, you're gonna be in for a fight. But, <laughs> but I, I seriously offer up this time to allow the Lord to work. I, I believe that he's already been working in hearts. If there's something that you need to deal with, something you need to repent of, maybe it has nothing to do with this right here and you just need to go before the Lord then I encourage you to do that now in this time of invitation. Let's pray.